catch up with Kiris. Did you reject him? He just vanished. I took myself off. Okay. What is ten reason by ten? Sorry? I don't see ten reason. Oh, I see. They're down the bottom now. Yeah. So, I assume I will get the queue at the top as usual. He's also switched to all clans. Oh, I didn't see that. Yes, uh, no tools, switched to all clans. Is that going to break if I do that? I'm fine with this. Let's just yeah. go with it. <laughs> go with it and see what happens. I did my own practice session, but it seemed to be limited on what I could do, so I didn't really get very far. So I'm going to have to kind of play it by ear and hope. I think it's the same buttons, just in different places. Um, so, yeah. Well, that's it. <laughs> yeah, it would have been, would have been nice if two weeks notice that they were changing the interface. Hi folks, let's, let's make a start. Um, this is the, the best meeting. As I mentioned, it's an enormous room, so do feel free to come towards the front. We won't hold it against you if you haven't read all the drafts. So just a, a note, first of all, if you can make sure that you've signed the virtual blue sheet by um, scanning the QR code at the front here. And that will that will log you into uh, Meet Echo. Um, so my name is Matthew Bocci. Um, just want to introduce. First of all, we have a new um, additional co-chair, who's uh, Jeffrey Zhang, sitting next to me. Um, Stefan is still co-chairing as well, but unfortunately he's uh, not well at the moment, so he is uh, remotely uh, connecting to the meeting. And uh, Mankamana is going to be uh, acting as a secretary and. Uh, doing our minutes for us. I just want to say that I, it's, been, it's an honor to be able to serve this community. I will do my best. Thank you. OK, so as is uh, just a reminder of the, the notes well at the start of the meeting. So it basically says anything you say here is taken as a contribution to the ITF and bound by all of those uh, rules. So please take a, take a minute to look over this. Okay, as I mentioned, uh, please make sure you've signed into the session using Meet Echo. Um, and if you want to speak at the queue, use your Meet Echo client on, on your phone to, um, or, your, or your Mac, I guess, or, or your laptop uh, to uh, join the mic queue. Um, and for remote participants, please unmute yourselves only when the chairs have indicated you can speak. And, and just another note for the presenters, um, we do have the presentation mic way up here on, on the stage, and I have a laser pointers, so if you can come around the back of us, uh, there's steps on, probably steps on either end of the stage uh, and present from there when, when you come to uh, have your slots, if you're here in person. 
Okay, here is the agenda, um, busy as usual. Um, just one thing of note, the uh, second draft on the agenda, the V4, V6, P, all South, A, and Gaon, that only got uploaded when the submission tool opened this morning. So you may not have an, had an opportunity to read that, but um, Gaon wants to give a quick update on, on that. Any other comments on the agenda? Oh, one other thing, please go easy on the chairs if there's a few hiccups on the um, display of the slides. There's a new interface on, uh, on MeTeco and we're just getting used to it. Okay, so now on to the working group status update. Uh, there is one, no, no RFCs out of, out of BESS, but there was one that is of interest to BESS from the NVO crew working group. This is the EVPN applicability document that was published as RFC 9469. Um, we have a number of documents in the RFC editor's queue now, so things are moving along nicely. Um, we have three which are held because of misrefs. Um, we have um, the EVPN LSP ping draft, um, the EVPN ICID CMAC flush draft, and the EVPN aggregation label draft, also in the RFC editor's queue. Do any authors do stop me at any time if you want to say anything about these documents? Um, we have a few drafts with, with Andrew or going through IESG review. Um, we did a second working group last call following the initial um, AD review on the virtual Ethernet segment draft that should be back with, that's back with you now. Um, the IRB extended mobility, the um, IRB multicast draft, and the um, VPWS flexible cross connect draft are with um, in AD review. Andrew is just checking something for, for those um, joining remotely. Could, could you go to the mic, actually? Sorry, it's uh, such a big room that... Um, the IRB multicast document has passed ITF general last call, so I'm just doing final checks, and that'll be telechatted fairly soon. Um, virtual Ethernet segment document that I am about to start my second evaluation on that now. Um, I will hopefully be pushing that into an ITF last call within the next week or two. Um, the VPWS FXC document is also currently in my evaluation state at the moment, so I'm busy going through that. The extent of mobility I need to check on further. That's just an update from my side. Thanks, Andrew. Ali, did you want to say something? Uh, yeah, I have a comment about the LSP ping uh, in the previous page. Uh, in the RFC editor, basically has gone through the RFC editor. All the editing has been done. All the co-author have signed up on it. Uh, it is waiting for Andrew. And uh, it's in the RFC editor's queue for the LSP ping draft. I'm confused. <clears throat> the RFC uh, that comes after it has clear all the uh, uh, all the editing and it is ready for uh, RFC publication. Yeah, so you, you, is it in Auth 48 now? Pardon me? Is it in Auth 48 now? Yes, yes. it has Correct. completed Auth, uh, uh, it is waiting for Andrew to basically check mark the Auth 48. Okay, thank you. So we have a, a queue of documents under Shepherd's review at the moment. Um, 
Ranking Commander shepherding the redundant multicast source draft. Um, he's done a review. Um, do you want to say anything about that? So there are some minor comments which needs to be fixed before I do the write-up. So I have sent the comment to authors. All right. Um, the fast DF recovery draft. So there was um, one comment from in the, I think it was in the original director review that Adrian, Adrian did um, about whether this was a, really an update or not and whether we should, because we changed it to being to updating 7432 or indicating the update is 7432 after the last call. So I think there was a little bit of concern that this, uh, this change uh, occurred late in the process. So I did run a, a call on the list to see if there were any concerns about that separately, and I need to close that call. But I think so far nobody's indicated any concerns with interoperability with legacy RFC 7432 implementations. Um, the EVPN MHPA draft is um, with Stefan. Uh, he's, we've requested a general review and um, then a uh, write up will be done. Um, Jeffrey, you have the MH Split Horizon draft. Um, so the comments have basically been addressed. Uh, we, I think we agree to make one more change on the drafts so once that is done we'll just move it to the next step okay the um unequal load balancing draft um there's region director and general reviews pending for that um and we still have the evpn at geneva geneva draft which is waiting for implementation since we have a, a rule about we must have at least one implementation for a um standards track document to progress. So please um, send a note to the chairs if you're aware of any implementations of this. Okay, we have a couple of documents that, that um, did, not con did not have sufficient consensus to progress uh, through working group last call. The, um, uh, the L2 gateway protocol draft had too little comment or too, too little, um, there was not enough sufficient visibility that people had reviewed the document and supported progressing it on the list. Um, please speak to us or speak up on the list if you would like to see this document progress. Um, so the EVPN, IPVPN interworking document. So this was one that there was an issue raised by the IDR review of the document and we're still waiting I think on a Jeff said he wanted to do a, a final review of that document. Jeff should be, I don't know if Jeff is here at the ITF in person. He, he is on the agenda. Jeff, do you want to say anything? Uh, yeah, I'm behind. So uh, the intention is to do it. Uh, the, uh, we have completed the DPATH portion of the review. Uh, we've come to, I think, a good conclusion on that one. That was the scary piece. Uh, my intent is to basically do a top to bottom for the rest of the stuff and make sure they haven't missed anything else. Okay. Uh, I will endeavor to finish it before the end of this week. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, we have a queue of documents we believe are ready for working group last call. Um, I should have just, just raised the issue of the SD1 usage draft. There was a, an issue with the, so this, this had already been sent to the IESG and um, one of the ADs spotted an issue, a restrictive clause in the I think it, it restricted the copyright on it. Uh, maybe, I, Andrew, if you want to say something about that. Um, by the way, I apologize on the LSP ping thing. I actually thought I'd sent that to Iana, but I have just sent it. If that's all good to go, so that's cleared. I've just sent that now. Um, on the SD WAN document, basically, in the boilerplate, there was a clause which basically stops adoption of documents containing that clause. And somehow it had been missed. And the problem with that clause being there is that the working group technically should not have adopted the document in the first place because once a document is adopted by the working group, it's a working group document. 
And with that clause there, it creates all sorts of issues. And because of that, once that was realized, the only option was to then basically readopt the document by the process um, to avoid potential issues down the line with you know, appeals and goodness knows what else could come out of that. So it's just a matter of following the process. Um, I didn't see it as a big issue to get it you know, readopted and then go through the process again. We just put that on an expedited track. But unfortunately, with that particular boilerplate that was in there, there wasn't too much of an option within the process but to do what was done. So I think some of the, in some of the earlier versions, of particularly the Word document template, there were, there were some things in there that said, either choose this paragraph or choose that paragraph. And it's very easy to let the wrong paragraph slip through. And once it's in the working group, people often just don't read the boilerplate again because we're all focused on the technical content. But this legal stuff at the top is really important. So if you do notice any of it, and we will try and be more careful about reviewing that at an earlier stage now, um, yeah, just make sure that, that, that there's nothing in there that would restrict the progress of your draft. Okay, I'm going to move forward a little bit quickly now because uh, we're running behind a bit. Um, we have a queue for adoption fairly lengthy queue for adoption files. We're going to start those running again after, after this ITF. Okay. And yes, and quite a few active, active drafts in, in the document, in, in, in the working group. Uh, the most recently adopted was the BGP SRV6 arguments uh, draft. Where's he gone in the queue? There he is. Donald, you're in the queue. I'm just going to... Yeah. You can speak. So <clears> this is Donald E. Stake with Future Way. I believe that the, the uh, EVPN BFD uh, draft is uh, ready for working group last call. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, we'll look at adding that to the queue after the ITF. has been around for, for some time and quite a bit of work done on it. So, Jeff. Speaking with my BFD chair head, uh, would you please make sure that uh, the BFD working group is included in that last call? Yeah. Thank you. Any other comments on, on this list? And I think that's it for the working group status update. So first up for the presentation is Mankamana. Right, I'm going to try and find your slides. Yeah, if you want that, I'm just trying to find it. It's the same as I'm trying to find it. Good afternoon. Uh, I'll be presenting this EVPN MVPN interop on behalf of other authors. So this draft has been around for quite some time. And last time when there were major changes, it was presented in IETF 112. And post which we had three more refresh. And the revision four had some of the INS section allocation related information updated. And it was based on some of the other drafts, which became RFC. And revision five had very minor changes. Right now, it is mostly running the ID nets, fixing all the uh, testimony and other things, some of the text. And there were some not relevant text which were removed in latest revision. As of now, it has been deployed, implemented, and being used in multiple different type of use cases. And draft as well has been mature and stable for last two plus years. We don't. We have not seen any big comment or changes in last two years. So now we would like. So authors would like to go for last call. Jorge Rabada, Nokia. Um, 
Thanks, Mankamana. I have a couple of comments. I went through the document and the uh, section about uh, multi-homing and UMH selection. It basically says that um, all the downstream PEs will do the same hash to select the, uh, the same UMH PE. And, and basically that, uh, that basically uh, makes sure that there is no traffic duplication whatsoever. What I'm missing here is uh, in MVPN, you have different ways of uh, selecting the UMH P, right? So you may have some inconsistencies and, and even in RFC 6513, you have a entire section nine that talks about uh, duplication and how to avoid it and all that. So what I would really like to see in the draft is a uh, reference to that section on, on the RFC and, and say if, it, if you know, all, all of it applies or there are some things that do not apply for some reason. So that would be the first comment. The uh, second comment that I have is in the um, gateway section. Um, there is some text explaining how to, when you go from VXLAN to uh, MVPN and, uh, and TLS, there's some text about uh, what to do with the different route types, right? And for instance, the IPMC AD routes, they stay within the same domain, right? They are relevant to the domain. They are not redistributed between domains. But uh, what it caught my attention is that the SPMC AD routes, it seems that they are redistributed. Whereas in my understanding, usually the SPMC AD routes are triggered by data itself, normally not by receiving a route, right? So I, I was wondering if that creates any sort of limitations in the solution, in the sense that normally when you generate an, an SPMC AD route, uh, there are different things that you can take into account, not only the, um, the data rate, but also the, uh, you know, the remote PEs that are uh, actually trying to pull some stream, stuff like that. And if you simply uh, you know, pass the, the route from one domain to the other, maybe you are missing some of the functionality there. I don't know if you have any comments. So, so right now, I think we'll have to see which section you're talking about. But if I summarize your uh, two questions, so first thing is make sure that it is aligned with 651314 with respect to multi-homing and UMH selection. Even yes. with SPMZ procedures, it has to be in alignment with 651314. If there is any change, we should be calling out clearly in this document. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be great. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, any other comments? No, good, thanks. Gern, you're on next. Uh, hi, can everyone hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Hi, my name is Guillaume Mishra. I'm in presenting this draft um, V4, V6, PE, all SAPI on behalf of co authors. Next slide. Uh, so, just a quick recap. So, this, uh, so, we had two original drafts. The original draft was adopted in uh, 2021, and this was a, a based on proof of concept testing for IPv4 NRI over IPv6 NextOp, and the focus was on uh, SAPI 1. 128 and 129. Uh, so after that, uh, there was another draft that was published that uh, was presented in ITF 114, and it uh, extends the concept to all SAPI and is uh, for this alternative dual stacking scheme. And this supports uh, all, all SAPI SAPI over an IPv6 next stop. Next slide. Uh, so in IETF 114, this was also uh, presented, and uh, feedback from the uh, from the work group was uh, to uh, some thoughts on combining drafts. So this first draft is IPv4 NRI uh, PE design. So this is this has parity to the IPv6, uh, only where this is actually over a, over a single V4 peer. Uh, so this the focus on this first draft is basically VCP proof of concept testing. Of, of IPv6 LNRI over an IPv4 next top, and it was focused on SAPI 1, 128, 129. And then this next draft at the bottom, 
this is basically extending to all SAFI support. And and it had a, 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 um, a new code point of BGP capability code point for next hop encoding uh, that is not a mapped uh, V4, uh, mapped V6 address, but a uh, but instead a uh, V4 next hop, similar uh, parity to RFC 8950. Next slide. So <clears throat> uh, this past summer after IETF 117, after presenting it, um, we had a, a, a good discussion on, on the mailing list about why to combine the drafts and the reasons to combine the four drafts, the three drafts that were presented. Uh, the original draft for, uh, on the past, on the previous slide, the V4 and MLRI SAFI, that was actually, there was two separate drafts and they were combined after IETF 114. But then after 114, uh, this, this discussion that we had after this past IETF was basically combining um, the existing three drafts into a single new draft. So the V4 concept of the IPv4 uh, only P design and the IPv6 only P design, combining them into a single draft. And that's basically, has, they both have the same functionality and parity of an alternative uh, dual stacking concept and proof of concept testing for SAFI 1, 128, 129. Uh, both drafts have the same concepts and sem semantics of a single peering design eliminating other protocol peering, and it, it provides an alternative dual stacks approach. Uh, both SAFIs are also well, are as well extensible to support all SAFI. Um, and then with the combined draft, um, it provides a uh, combined, uh, you know, single spot for the V4, V6 architectural specification. So simplification uh, over having multiple drafts. So the, the work group was pulled on July 27th and we received consensus from the work group on August 7th, and then the chair's um, approval on August 17th, and then after which we uh, worked on getting the drafts combined. So the drafts have been combined, and the latest draft has been uploaded to, um, to the data tracker, and now we're, um, we'd like to get uh, some feedback on if, if folks get a chance to review the latest updated draft, uh, please review. and. Um, provide comments on the mailing list. Next slide. Um, so I uh, just wanted to note that uh, with this, with the com combine of the drafts, uh, one of the benefits is that we, in the proof of concept testing of the V4 and RLRI over V6 next half, and as, as well of uh, V4 and RLRI over V6 next half, so that both, both concepts were now able to test both in parallel. So that really helps uh, really having them both combined versus being serial. Uh, next slide. And we've been making uh, good progress on the IPv4 and LRI over IPv6 next up. And now we're going to start up. Um, we'll probably have a call with the um, with the vendors uh, later on this year, um, just to review the IPv6 and LRI over IPv4 next up uh, v4 peering design, and um, hopefully we can kickstart that testing and um, get get moving on the draft and plan for. Um, Next year, hopefully we can uh, continue to progress this draft. Next slide. Thank you. Um, if anyone has any questions yet, please um, you know, send over to the mailing list. And um, um, any questions now, uh, yeah, please let me know. Thank you very much. See ya. Okay, any, that's going to, any comments? No, thank you. Thanks. Jeff, I think you're. Good afternoon, I'm Jeff Haas. They get, they get their steps in, just getting onto the stage here. So I'm here to talk about uh, something that's not terribly exciting, but very, very important, you know, core BGP plumbing. As a working group, BESS is you know, one of the groups that is primarily responsible for doing extensions to BGP that are outside of IDR. And occasionally we've had problems based on 
know, rules that we thought are clear in the RFC, you know, not getting paid attention to and having to fix things up after the fact. So as part of uh, discussing uh, this core plumbing issue, we had to come up with a name. You know, it was like, uh, what happens when you have a path attribute in BGP that gets outside of the scope of where it's actually being used? And what happens when you, know, you do this and it causes problems, or at the very least, you no, know, is uh, inappropriate disclosure? So anytime that we have stuff get outside of BGP, you know, where it's intended to be, you know, we're calling this, or at least I'm calling this, you know, BGP attribute escape. You know, this is just my term. You know, we have to start somewhere. Um, important thing is this is not escape in the context of you know, prisoner breaking out of jail. It's really closer to dog wandering off. You know, it's just not going where it's supposed to be because that's how the protocol actually works. And you know, these are usually normal occurrences of the protocol doing what it's supposed to do. And occasionally it's due to configuration, but sometimes you know, no configuration is going to be able to help you with these problems. So why did I write this document? You know, the BGP RFCs are actually pretty clear about how things work, but sometimes the consequences of how things naturally work aren't clear. Was, I've had in the other conversations during this IETF, some people are confused about you know, how BGP actually does pass things around. You know, so these intrinsic behaviors of BGP, you know, for when you're actually doing something new, means, you know, it's like, what, what does where it belongs means? You know, what, what is the scoping of these things? And one of the common bits of feedback, you know, best authors have gotten from IDR, uh, especially the last year and a half or so, has been, you know, have you considered, you know, is this attribute where it belongs? And what happens when it isn't? Are you appropriately cleaning things up at the edges? Are you potentially uh, dealing with uh, these things are being attached maliciously? You know, what are the considerations for these things? And the whole point is, let's let's start writing these things down in a very clear fashion as you know protocol maintainers to help you actually build better BGP extensions for the future. So, wh what's the actual problem here? If you have you no know, routers in your network that are receiving BGP routes that are features that are locally significant for some reason, but don't necessarily belong, well then potentially, if it's gotten out of scope, bad things could happen. So I'll pick a couple examples, and you know, several of these examples are very particular to the work that's been done in BES. So, so example, the prefix SID work was originally done here. You know, if a prefix SID gets outside of a domain that is where it belongs, you potentially can have something trying to do SR style forwarding off to something that's in a you know, foreign network. You know, the attribute is escaped, traffic is going the wrong place, this is a bad thing. Tunnel encaps attribute, the other thing that uh, is near and dear to your hearts, you know, you're throwing all sorts of interesting encapsulation information in this for your various you know, use cases inside of BES. Well, what happens if that is attached to a standard IPv4 unicast route and it gets out to the internet and some other box far away sees this tunnel and caps and proceeds to send your traffic to three networks over. That's probably not what you intended to happen. Uh, sometimes this is exactly as boring as something that's an extended community. You know, maybe you have you no know, communities that got out where they're supposed to be and they cause you know, maybe wrong VPN behaviors. You know, this is a route target that was from you know, one provider, gets into second provider, they're using a similar route target format and stuff drops into the wrong VPNs and that may not be what you're intending to happen. And you know, probably the scariest piece is you know, what happens if route selections you know, negatively impacted. You know, a lot of this stuff is also motivated by BGP incremental deployment. And you know, one of the things that we had out of this was you know, what well, I've called in the past optional transitive nonsense. BGP wants you to, you know, for easy deployment of these things, make these things transitive. And transitive in BGP sense means if you don't understand the thing, it's okay to pass it along to you know, the other routers downstream. If they don't care about it, well, they'll pass it along anyway. And the consequence is, you know, when things get where they don't belong and they're wrong, you know, originally before we made changes for 7606, your session would drop, even though the router that's directly next to you didn't have a single thing to do with it. So this was a strong motivation, especially for the attribute 128 case uh, that originally motivated you know, a large outage. Uh, we put together better error handling procedures. We do better 
that was a step in the right direction. You know, minimally, you know, the procedures help us to not crash. They ideally help us avoid session resets. And the bigger problem was, why did this thing even get out of the network in the first place? This is a local L3 VPN feature. Why did this even happen? Pick a different uh, feature. This one largely worked on an IDR and it's been a source of interesting hilarity among operators recently. Is the BHP entry label feature. You know, Juniper published the thing in RFC 6790. It was basically boring. Hi, I support entropy label. And it had no scoping information on it. And very soon after, uh, and Linda, I'll happily take questions after the uh, presentation. Um, after we actually uh, shipped the RFC, we realized it had a problem. It, you know, this attribute escaped, and it meant that networks that didn't necessarily do entropy label at the right spots would potentially receive it far away and cause forwarding problems. You know, your MPLS label stack got malformed. Uh, so we very quickly issued a draft that uh, said, no, this is deprecated, don't do this. And well, unfortunately, even though we did that, some other vendors got sort of pushed into doing what Juniper had been working on as the replacement for entropy label. We screwed up. We put it in the same code point that entropy label was living in. You know, we call it effectively entropy label v2. And this now means that we have non-interoperable scenarios. So this was causing session resets you know, and bad things if you don't have error handling turned on. Um, so this is an entire chain of things that just simply shouldn't happen. But it's a perfect example that when you have disagreeing path attributes, which can happen for all sorts of reasons, including drafts that are in progress that you ship version one of the thing and version two changes the format. This can cause anything from session resets to just simply you know, bad handling of the updates where they get drawn. This was the one that uh, I owe, have owed a review on for LLBS, you know, specifically on the dpath attribute. You know, it's defined as an additional uh, loop prevention method for L3 VPN and eVPN interactions necessary feature, but it only belongs in a, you know, a very tight scope for an eVPN network. Unfortunately, you know, the original specification of the thing, you know, as a consequence of these being L3 VPN routes, could escape out as IPv4 unicast, because L3 VPNs talk to the internet sometimes. And we saw that some vendors actually had issues with route selection, because DPATH says, if you have this thing, it's going to change the order of preference. And what this meant was, if you had a partial deployment of some boxes do dpath, some boxes don't, inconsistent route selection can actually mean forwarding loops. And even if it didn't give you a forwarding loop, it meant that a route that had a dpath on it from somebody's data center is now the worst possible route ever. And that loses you money because you're no longer tracking traffic that way. That's a bad thing. So this is another example that some of these things are probably scoped off to address families. And scoping is really the discussion we're trying to have here. And this is the feedback you're getting consistently you know, at this point from IDR. And ideally, this becomes part of your review processes. You know, we start discussing you know, what sort of scoping do we tend to mean. And mostly, you know, there's a small number of scopes that we tend to use in BHP on a regular basis. AS level scoping is very common. You know, we see that out of things like extended communities. Um, problem is, you know, some things are more tightly scoped than that. You know, what happens if something is scoped to a next top? Like for example, the entropy label work, we fix that inside of the next top capability work that's going through IDR right now. Um, and that's potentially a generic you know, fix that we're going to have for this piece of the feature. You know, we've added to the tool set. Um, but sometimes tools can't help you. Some features have to be consistently deployed in an AS so that route selection issues don't have you end up being with loops. We don't have a consistent mechanism for this. Things like making the attributes non-transitive and capability scoped or address family scoped means that uh, consistent deployment may actually be a little bit easier to enforce or at least not cause you to blow up. This is again, very near and dear to the hearts of people working on best related protocols because significant numbers of your features, especially for eVPN, require flag day deployments within portions of your data centers. You need to be thinking about these things anyway. This is just another thing to be thinking about. 
As I mentioned, communities, they're boring things. We've had flavors of these things around for almost as long as BGP has been alive. Uh, for extended communities in particular, uh, they can have escape problems too. You know, do the platforms clean these things up? One of the things I encourage you to look at as a working group uh, in the upcoming GROW meeting is there's an update to the BCP for BGP operations that talks about cleaning things up. This is a place where you should be discussing things that are, you know, all of you should know as people trying to change the BGP protocol. And, you know, when you're dealing with people like operators, you know, you want to make sure that, you know, the systems can do the right things. Communities can contain sensitive information, you know, things like you no know, tunneling information, redirect addresses, that sort of thing. Uh, vendors do not have, and speaking as one, consistent, easy to use cleanup procedures right now. The BCP documents, the best we have right now at some point, Ideally, our you know, operators will push us to have more consistent mechanisms. And a thing I encourage you as a working group to think about for your explicit mechanisms, as part of your cleanup and scrubbing procedures, you should have as part of your operational section, here's things that I expect to be cleaned up at my network boundary because they stop being relevant here. Give this advice not only to yourselves for your implementers to do something with, but for operators to know that you can safely filter these things. Sometimes we even have you no know, boring you know, things like large communities go too far. And again, this is, you know, these are generic things. They don't have any specific magic circumstances, not a link bandwidth, it's not a route target, but it's a magic number that in somebody else's network might do something bad. You know, again, see the BCP discussion that's happening and grow. One of the big reasons to have this discussion is, especially for those of you who've been paying attention to the news, uh, sometimes these things are not okay accidental you can actually attach some of these things and sorry, sorry jeff can you move forward a bit more quickly because yep, we're I'd, out of time I'd like, I'd like two, two slides thank you so this can be uh, done in a malicious fashion and actually you know uh, be used to attack and crash networks uh, so that's another reason for you all to pay attention to this because when your feature is the one that's used to crash you no know, 10 percent of the internet you're not going to be a happy camper mitigations you know, mitigating these things uh, really is about, you know, what do we do filtering? We don't want to necessarily do indiscriminate filtering on these things, because if you make operators throw out everybody's path attributes, you will never deploy a new feature ever again incrementally. We don't want to do that. So we have to be better about how we do things. We need to have, you know, better easy modes for doing filtering uh, for, you know, different uh, features. Again, this should be part of your operational considerations when you're doing stuff. You know, so please put these inside of your documents. At some point, maybe we'll get to a BGP-5 that has some of these things baked in. You know, next steps is really, we're going to you know, continue socializing. This is an idea. You're the last working group that needed to have this presentation. IDR hasn't figured out exactly what we'd like to do with this document. We'll figure that out a little bit later. Um, but consistently, what we're going to be asking, you're going to see this from the IDR chairs as part of our review criteria, even if the document's not adopted. Take these lessons to heart. We'll figure out a consistent place to write these down for new documents. That's the end of the presentation. Do we have time for Linda? Thank you. Linda, I think you're in the, in the queue. Uh, Linda Dumber from FutureWay. Thank you very much for your presentation. I find that lots of useful information. So um, I have one thing I'm not too clear. So, so this attribute escape, are we talking about per attribute? Like I may have attached like maybe multiple attributes. Yes. So for every attribute, you need to find a way to mitigate it from escape to the unwanted places, right? You have to figure out what the scoping properties of your thing is. You know, so uh, like the conversation we had earlier in the week, you know, it's a very tight walled garden type application. Uh, the question is what happens when it escapes out the walled garden? That's really the conversation here. When things get outside of their scoping, they can be bad. Figure out what's bad, and then we figure out what to do about it. Okay. The second thing is, uh, um, this week I learned that um, the transitive, as you mentioned, transitive only mean that if you don't understand, you forward, right? But I have talked to many people. I'm not the only one thinking transitive, meaning the packet comes, I can send it to, I can forward to my uh, uh, next one, right? right? So will you or somebody be able to Add a note to INA, like non-transitive means transitive if I don't understand. That will help lots of people, except especially mm -hmm. people don't, who don't come here. Well, and that's the challenge. This is 
right in the core PHP RFC. And yes, the same word is used in different contexts. You know, for path attributes, it's do I understand. For extended communities, it's no AS scoping. We can't change the wording. It's in the RFC that's been published for 20 plus years. The best we can do is educational outreach like this to make sure that we mention this. And as, again, as part of the review criteria, when you ask for new path attributes, we're going to be asking you, you know, as you got your own review, what is the intended transitivity of this and how are you preventing the escape? Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Thank you for your time. If there's other questions, please feel free to send them to IDR. Yeah, Sasha, please, I know you're in the queue, but please could you send your comments to the list? We're uh, very behind. Thank you, Joe. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Krishna Swami. I will be presenting a multi-site uh, eVPN on behalf of uh, my co-authors. This, this draft has been uh, around for uh, uh, some time, but uh, it was never uh, presented in uh, IDF. Uh, the idea is to, to present it here. We have made a significant changes in the version 3, and uh, right now the current version is uh, version 5. So this is the quick agenda. Yeah. Why a uh, multi-site, right? So the eVPN nodes or the eVPN tabs are significantly increasing uh, in, the, in the data center, so which is bringing a lot more challenges with respect to the number of routes and number of tunnel endpoints uh, that, that we could have in the, in the domain. Then, uh, so, and now uh, also uh, once we try to split these uh, domains and uh, we would like to connect it uh, over the simple uh, IP backbone, where we just make use of the same kind of an encapsulation, right? And also, there should be a flexible way to allocate the, the VNIs uh, such, such that uh, when we do the stitching, right, so each site could have a different mapping to a MAC war for an uh, uh, IP war. Also, uh, the BUM optimization uh, is also something uh, what uh, is being looked at. Okay. So what is a site, right? So the site is just an eVPN domain uh, consisting of uh, eVPN nodes uh, uh, front-ended by uh, gateways. So this particular draft uh, introduces a concept of a border gateway where a gateway node that separates uh, you know, multiple sites or a fabrics or a pods or a DCs. It also acts as an uh, entry and then uh, uh, exit uh, a point. So, so the idea of the border gateway is uh, within the site, only the site uh, taps, they just know about uh, the border gateways and they don't have any idea about uh, the other site uh, uh, taps. Okay, and site is something uh, you know which has been uh, uh, has a representation only on the on the border gate gateway, so that way there is no need of further uh, you know uh, the software update that we need to do on the uh, on the leaves. Okay, and the more could, important. Could you, sorry, could you move along a bit more quickly because you've got okay. eleven slides to get through in two minutes now. So. Uh, right. Actually, I. Uh, I have a next presentation. Oh, so you've merged them in. Okay. Yes, so I will uh, try to cover oh, it up. Uh, make, make up the time. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. So we thought, uh, you know, uh, as authors, we thought first let's have a quick comparison with uh, RFC 9014. So that way it provides a very clear clarity on what we are trying to achieve with uh, multi site uh, EVPN draft. So for interconnect, uh, uh, you know, RFC 9014 provides both a single box or a two box uh, solution, but in multi-site VPN, it will be a single single box solution. So there are multiple uh, end caps are available with uh, 9014, but in, in our draft, it's mainly we are focusing on uh, VXLAN. The gateway mode, it's a multi-path, multi uh, you know, primary IP is what is being there on the RFC 9014. So we uh, will be using the AnyCast uh, uh, IP, and also there is a provision to do use a multipath PIP, 
I'm going to cover uh, the main advantages of uh, Anycast, uh, the web address on the border gateways in the upcoming slide. ECMP, it's uh, both uh, underlay and overlay in case of 9014. And with uh, Anycast web, it's a pure underlay uh, uh, ECMP. Right, so then the RT1, which will be both consumed and reoriginated uh, in 9014, but uh, in case of uh, multi-site uh, 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 with any cast wave, there is no there is no need for uh, a RT1 as uh, you know we don't have a overlay on uh, next up. Yes, with uh, with the multipath pip, uh, we do uh, need to you know consume and reoriginate. RT2s are reoriginated with uh, IESI and. Uh, in case of uh, any cast, you know, the ESI is going to be uh, zero. RT3 and RT4, both consumed and reoriginated as they are have a local scope. The RT5, the 9014 doesn't cover uh, 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 for uh, type 5. Uh, the EVP and IPVP and interworking draft uh, does uh, cover it. So we are trying to combine, uh, uh, you know, both the draft uh, but, and type 5 routes are going to be reoriginated either uh, in a VIP mode or in a VIP mode. Okay, RD and RTs uh, are separate for intra and intra DC for 9014, and for uh, multi-site uh, AVP and we have a uh, same RT for both intra and uh, intra DC, and we will have a separate RD for uh, WIP and the PIP. So VNA allocation is can be global, and uh, some other important one is yes. So the bump tree, uh, uh, right? So it will there will be uh, two separate uh, bump trees uh, for intra and uh, intra DC. The same applies to uh, multi-site uh, EVP. Okay. So, in the interest of the time, I would like to cover uh, more on the Anycast uh, border gateway. Uh, what is the significant uh, the usage uh, that it uh, provides? Right. So, there is a significant benefit uh, with respect to the the control plane uh, route scale. Right. So, there is a no a no RT1. Right. So, so that's. Uh, that's uh, that is going to bring down the the control plane scale, and also since using an anycast IP address, so the ECMP is also going to be in uh, underlay, so which will bring uh, you know some of the hardware resources, uh, ECMP groups and uh, stuff like that. So that also it scales uh, uh, scales much better. Also with respect to the convergence, uh, since the convergence is in underlay. Right, so there is no need of uh, you know sending a mass withdraw in, in the overlay for the for the convergence. So there is a significant uh, benefit uh, with respect to uh, uh, convergence, and also it specifically it simplifies as we are you know decoupling uh, too many things uh, from the overlay ECMP uh, perspective. But with respect to the multipath border gateway, it will be like you know more or less uh, similar to uh, what we have in RFC nine zero one four. Okay. So maybe in the interest of time, and there are no changes with respect to the host uh, mobility and uh, the convergence, uh, as I mentioned, it's uh, mainly with underlay, so it converges much faster. So we have some stuff added to the MVPN section, and we are going to add uh, the few more things in our upcoming uh, uh, versions. OK. Jorge Rabadan, Nokia. Um, yeah, thanks for the presentation. So on the uh, comparison between 9014 and this draft, um, yeah, it called my attention that on the split horizon row, you say under 9014 that is a local bias. Well, it's local bias for VXLAN, but it can be you know ESI-based uh, right. split horizon for MPLS, right? or argument for yeah, SRC, uh, yeah. et cetera. Correct. Thanks for clarification. I think you know, since uh, in the multi-site EVPN, we are only supporting VXLAN, so we just yeah. come. Thanks. And the uh, ESI type zero, at the time it was you know, the, uh, a secure way to make sure that the, uh, the ESIs were unique, but nothing prevents you from using a different uh, ESI type. But uh, regardless, my, my question to you would be, if you combine RFC 9014 for layer two and the EVP and IPVPN interworking draft for layer three, what is this draft adding? So, so the, it's basically the Anycast uh, VTEP that is, case? Uh, that's correct, Anycast uh, VTEP. Yeah. Okay, that's the only thing. So that's the, yes, so that's the one and then some of the reorigination uh, methods, right? 
so that's that's one thing yeah and and how the how we are handling the esi is and also not not making use of uh, uh, route type 1 sure which is a consequence of, consequence uh, of the correct. NECAS yes that's correct yeah it would be nice to see you know cluster clear in the drafts so what are the deltas really compared to the existing specifications right uh, right. I think uh, we just added this particular uh, chart. So probably, yeah, we are going to add one for the IP, okay, cool. IP, EVP, and inter uh, working right. draft. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Any more? No. Thank you. I think it's Eric. Next. Oh, next. Oh, I thought you were. Yes. Five You're minutes. Right. You've got five minutes. Oh, five minutes. <laughs> yeah. Sure, I will uh, rush it through. Uh, See so on the preloaded slides. Synchronized and cast. Yeah. It was loaded, but it's not showing in. There we are. Sorry. Okay, yeah, please stick to four minutes now. Okay, sure. So, good, right? So, so today the EVPN IRB, right, we support uh, uh, distributed uh, uh, any cache gateway where the first off routing is uh, uh, provided to directly attached uh, uh, hosts or tenants. So, this draft, uh, we are trying to uh, highlight the procedures and the architecture for the centralized in cache gateway. So by making use of uh, the asymmetric, uh, uh, you know, the IRB procedures are defined in RFC 9135. So I'll quickly go through the control plane uh, operations uh, and also data plane operations. In control plane operations, we have uh, a centralized uh, gateway nodes, which are on the top of the top of this diagram. And in the bottom, we have the L2PE, which are mainly doing the layer two bridging only. Okay. So centralized uh, uh, the anycast uh, uh, gateway so they they will be hosting a multiple of for uh, this first uh, fhr for multiple uh, you know uh, the vlans now this could be uh, provisioned uh, even in uh, in the fashion of uh, a redundant uh, anycast uh, gateways for the purpose of uh, 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 redundancy and also for uh, load load balancing the centralized the gateway, so they will be, uh, uh, you know, advertising uh, the gateway uh, IP and the MAC uh, for their the respective uh, uh, the IRBs. Uh, then, uh, yeah, so this is something. Then, with respect to on the on the on the L2Ps, so ARP and ND snooping uh, uh, is uh, kind of a must, uh, uh, which will enable to advertise uh, the MAC IP route in RT2 with. Uh, with a single uh, L2 uh, VNI label, so this simplifies the operations on the uh, on the on the centralized uh, Anycast gateway, where uh, you know we don't it does not need to learn these MAC and IP over the data plane, rather than by snooping it on the on the L2PEs uh, uh, and advertising it to the CAG, and there is no need for even uh, syncing these ARP and ND across the redundant uh, CAGs. Okay. And in addition, L2Ps may also need to uh, do an ARP uh, refresh uh, for whenever there is a MAC ages out or an, or an ARP ages out. So now this is uh, something an additional. If if there is no response, then they are going to withdraw those RT2 routes. And if there is a response, then you know, there is no need to send an uh, additional update to uh, centralized uh, any cast gateways. Okay. In addition, uh, uh, L2Ps may also uh, install this uh, the gateway MAC IP into an ARP and ND suppression table to act as a uh, proxy, such that for any ARP or ND request, right, it could uh, locally uh, respond to respond to that. Right. With respect to the forwarding, the bridging, there are there is no there is no difference, right. But with respect to the routing, right, the L2PE is going to do a lookup for the uh, any cast uh, gateway MAC and uh, uses the the L2 tunnel to uh, send it to the centralized gateway. Where uh, after the MAC lookup, uh, it is going to identify uh, that this needs to be uh, this needs to be routed. And in the routing after the route lookup, if uh, you know the destination is locally attached, then uh, it is going to do uh, a MAC uh, a MAC rewrite 
or if it is uh, an L2 or L3 interconnect, or or it could be an uh, to an uh, another uh, L3 uh, PE, then it will do the regular routing. Okay, there are a couple of changes uh, with respect to the MAC and uh, IP mobility. On L2 PEs, uh, uh, should treat the remote uh, gateway MAC IP route. Uh, you know, learn from the CAG PE as a static, right? And it should not apply the, any uh, mobility uh, procedures when it learns uh, locally that particular MAC, and it should also uh, 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 notify the operator about the duplicate uh, uh, duplicate uh, MAC or IP. Then on the centralized uh, gateway, if, uh, the, uh, if the gateway MAC and IP is not provisioned and if it has already learned, uh, that gateway MAC and IP from some of the L2 PEs, then it has to follow the, it has to bump up the sequence number and advertise it so that way it gets a, a, all the L2 PEs can install this uh, gateway MAC IP and uh, get a chance to, uh, you know, uh, trigger the mobility. So, yes. right. can, can you skip to the concluding slides? Yes. Please? So there are two deployment models uh, that we have added, uh, uh, right? Uh, please uh, go over it. Uh, it has all the details. One is uh, interconnect model where there will be two, two separate uh, domains, one for L2 domain and another is an L2, L3 domain, or uh, a, a fully full meshed one where both L2 and, uh, uh, and L2, L3 uh, are in the same uh, domain. Yeah. Right, thanks. Okay, thank you. This is, this is a version zero of the draft, so there are a couple of people in the queue, but can you, we're out of time, so can you take your comments to the list, please? Please comment, please comment on the list. Because we're and, right uh, out of time. Can you, can you send your comments to the list and questions to the list, please? Thank you. Because we're right out of time. Okay. Thank Thanks. you. So, okay, Eric. Okay, so good afternoon. I'm uh, Eric Levy, presenting on behalf of my uh, co-authors uh, this draft for the first time in this working group. And next slide, please. So the the draft is uh, about SAVI and EVPN, and the goal of the draft is to describe. Uh, initially interactions, and then we decided to go one step further, integration between two technologies. One is SAVI, the other one is EVPN. So obviously you know about EVPN, let me tell you a little bit about SAVI. SAVI stands for Source Address Validation. Uh, it's uh, a security mechanism uh, that uh, is going to validate source address before allowing the traffic into the layer two network. It was standardized uh, almost 10 years ago as many RFCs, which I encourage you to, uh, to read. Uh, it is intended for large networks. So it scales by distributing the host database uh, of source addresses among all the access switches uh, so that an access switch only has local uh, entries and never remote entries and, 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 and like, for instance, CVPN. For validating a source, SAVI has two strategies. One should rely on DHCP assignment. If an address has been assigned by DHCP on a particular place of the network, then it's authorized in. And for non-DHCP addresses, the second mechanism used is first come first serve. So first time an address shows up somewhere, it's authorized. If it shows up somewhere else in the network, then it's not authorized. So SAVI is a fairly generic security solution for allowing uh, uh, source addresses into the network, covers both v4 and v6, uh, for all type of uh, addresses, whether they are assigned with DHCP, uh, static, stateless, or too configured for v6, and as far as v6, uh, it covers both link locals and, and global addresses. So this is just quick background on SAVI. Uh, next slide, please. 
So why do we need to write a draft? After all, there are enough RFCs on both sides uh, to cover all these mechanisms. So the first intent was really to write an ops draft uh, because we thought it was worth explaining how these two, techn two technologies would interact with each other. And in particular, uh, it was important to explain that when you want to deploy SAVI in a network like eVPN, because you need to have that level of security, there's going to be a price to pay. Uh, depending on the type of addresses, actually, uh, uh, we have listed here that particular price. First come, first serve. Uh, realize, if you remember, addresses uh, are only stored locally. So in order to verify that an address uh, is not existing somewhere else in the network, it relies on broadcasting or uh, link local scope uh, multicast, which is the same. And broadcasting in uh, that kind of network is not always your friend. Uh, the second price to pay, which is really important, is um, even if the address shows up for the first time before making sure that it doesn't exist somewhere else, you have to wait for anyone to respond uh, uh, to, the, to the query uh, uh, of existence. The uh, uh, node is going to switch, is going to wait uh, a, a given amount of time. By default, that's 500 milliseconds. So for, for the first 500 milliseconds, the source address will not be allowed in. And sometimes, especially when the host is moving, uh, that price is uh, uh, unacceptable. For DHCP assigned addresses, the price to pay is different. If the address shows up somewhere where it's not known as a DHCP address, then the switch has to go to the DHCP server with a list query, for instance, and that's going to create additional control traffic and, and time. Um, so, worth explaining was really the first uh, step, but then we said, well, maybe in an EVPN network we can do better. And now the draft, that's why we have uh, uh, this version 01, explain how to do better. And that's the difference for me between uh, uh, in, uh, interacting and integration. So, that particular draft is covering point one and two, how to do better uh, between SAVI and EVPN for FCFS, for first come, first serve. And there is another draft which covers the uh, point number three, which is DHCP. So uh, next slide, please, which is the last one. So we have this draft. Uh, if you guys are interested in performing source address validation uh, in an EVPN network, please read the draft. Ask questions, comment, everything is welcome. Uh, otherwise, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll stop that work there. Okay, Jorge, thank you. just very quickly, please. Yeah, very quick question. Uh, Eric, uh, thank you very much. Uh, just had a question about the section that talks about uh, when the ingress P is doing the source address validation and then the, the IP is locally uh, there received uh, from BGP and then we automatically validate the GIP, if I understood correctly. I was wondering, so what happens if you have, like, uh, you, you see, uh, when you do the source address validation, the IP is not there, but, but there is a BGP route, uh, an in-flight uh, BGP route coming, right? So if you do it right away, basically you validate the IP, but then the, the BGP route coming from a remote P is coming at the same time. So I don't know if, you know, if there is some room for you to, to clarify those things in the draft or okay, I, yeah. So, so, so you say, it, 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 are you talking about some race condition or the fact that BGP knows the route but it's not known locally yet? Yeah, I'm talking about the BGP propagation uh, time, right? So, in BGP, mm -hmm. it can take seconds to receive a route and right. And, uh, so, so, so there is, yeah, there, there is a small section on that. Uh, if it's not clear enough, I, I'd be happy to clarify it, and we can discuss on the mailing list. Uh, uh, but yeah, I, I've tried to explain uh, what do we do in the meantime if if if, uh, if the injury is about to, to to show up, but we don't have it yet. But uh, uh, yeah, if, if you can clarify the question, I'll try to clarify the text. Okay, I'll follow up. Thank you, okay. Andrew. Hi, Andrew Alston here. I'm um, just a very quick question. I just wondered 
in the context of this draft, if there'd been any coordination or socialization of this work within the SAVNET working group and what you sort of see as the relationship between this draft and the work that is going on in SAVNET, um, which is focused on source address validation. Thanks. So I haven't been following closely SAVNET, but my understanding is that SAVNET is more of an inter um, a subnet um, a type of uh, a security mechanism, which, which by the way, f followed up with SAVI, which was inter subnet, so really at the LAN level. Uh, so SAVI is at the LAN level, at the layer two or extended layer two level. And so uh, here, uh, what we, we have tried to cover is just that particular case, not the inter subnet, but just the intra uh, one. Okay, cool. L like I said, I mean, it's no problem with it. I just wondered if there had been any communication there just to avoid no, in the future. No. Thanks so much. Thank you. Okay, one just really quick. Sure, thank Professor you, Gail Arcus. Hey, Eric, thank you for the draft. Um, one quick question that I have, and maybe we can take it off the list also, um, is um, you are doing source address validation on an overlay SAFI. Typically, in a service provider networks, you have a couple of core facing links, and therefore, even if the Mac moves, you aren't being able to guarantee um, if the move is real or not. So maybe add some text to say how effective it would be when you are looking at overlay versus an underlay. Thank you. Okay, point taken. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Ali. I think you're. Good afternoon. My name is Ali Sajosi, and I'll be presenting L3 Optimize IRB. Uh, starting with the problem statement, what, why we are doing this, or why do we need uh, L3 optimization for IRB, is primarily for two reasons. The first one is the use cases to uh, when a bridge CE device is used with a limited Mac uh, capability. And in order to alleviate the Mac scale on that CE bridge that is connected to the PE, uh, that uh, is one use case to, uh, uh, for this optimization. And then the second, uh, and as a consequence of this uh, uh, Optimize uh, as a, a consequence of uh, alleviating these MAC scale on the CE device, we also improve the MAC scale on the PE device. For the second use case is basically, uh, there are uh, cases where the operator wants to only configure L3 uh, policies and quas on uh, both, uh, for both intera and inter subnet traffic. Uh, and uh, when they're operating in the IRB mode. So basically avoid turning on any L2 features such as L2 quas, L2 ACL, L2 policy forwarding, and so forth for intra subnet traffic. Uh, so that's the second use case. Uh, so if you look at the uh, traditional or our existing uh, EVPN IRB, in this figure, we have three PEs, and uh, three hosts are connected to the three PEs. H1 and H2 are in the same subnet, and as you can see there, uh, that subnet is uh, represented by uh, MacWerf1, and H3 is on a different subnet connected with MacWerf2. So if uh, with the current uh, EVP and IRB, H1 and H2, that they're in the subnet, same subnet, when they want to talk to each other, they do bridging, uh, uh, L2 forwarding. And when uh, host three wants to talk to 
either H1 or H2, then because it is a different subnet, it uh, uh, does it via the routing. With the L3 optimized IRB, basically we are gonna be doing routing for intra subnet. So when H1 and H2 need to uh, talk to each other, they're gonna be doing it via the L3 forwarding and not bridging. So if we're gonna do that, that uh, creates a bunch of caveats that it, uh, the operator needs to uh, fully be aware of that. Uh, so, uh, so that if they want to turn this feature on uh, for their given use cases, they need to understand that it comes with the ramifications. And these ramifications are, uh, some of them are listed here. Uh, one is, once you do for the intra subnet traffic, you do routing, then uh, you're gonna be doing multiple TTL decrement, one on the ingress and one on the egress. And uh, for certain application, uh, for the intra subnet, the TTL might be set to one. And if that's the case, then your packet gets discarded instead of getting forwarded. The second uh, issue is the source MAC gets rewritten. And for the application that re uh, they rely on the source MAC to identify the source, uh, that's going to create issue. Uh, the <clears throat> third is the subnet broadcast uh, is not going to be there. And uh, uh, for the unknown IP traffic uh, is going to get uh, the first packet is going to uh, basically is going to get clean uh, or uh, dropped. And uh, it's not going to work for the static ARP configuration. Uh, or any mechanism that avoids the regular R process. Uh, so these are the caveat. So with uh, those caveat in mind, the, uh, let's talk about the solution. Uh, solution overview, basically uh, it requires uh, very a small modification to the existing eVPN IRB. And the modification is to terminate the ARP and D messages, okay? And uh, uh, in here, in the first rev, it talks about two steps to do that. One is when the PE gets the uh, ARP and D message is gonna uh, uh, send the uh, unconditional response. And then uh, when it gets the data packet, uh, uh, the data packet, the first data packet uh, is gonna cause a Glyn for, uh, procedure and is gonna uh, initiate uh, uh, the uh, ARP uh, from the CPU. Uh, in the next rev, we're gonna talk about how we can combine the, these two steps into one. Uh, so uh, let's talk about the, uh, the ARP message uh, Handling, you know, uh, the, the next few slides are for the ARP and then the data uh, glint uh, and ARP response. So we go over these quickly. On the ARP message handling, when a host send the ARP request, uh, PE1, when it gets it, uh, PE1 terminates it and sends the ARP response with his own uh, MAC address. Uh, the uh, MAC address of his IRB interface. It sends that uh, uh, to the H1 uh, as if that MAC address is associated with the uh, destination IP address, destination IP address for host two. Uh, at the same time, PE1 learns the MAC and IP for the uh, host one, H1, Populates is stable and it advertises it in rod type two. This part is as we're currently do, uh, doing it uh, right now. But uh, what one major difference, it, it sends it with a flag saying that I am <coughs> operating in the uh, optimized 
uh, L3 optimized mode. And the purpose of this flag is when the PE2 gets it, uh, PE2 is gonna populate uh, the uh, L2 uh, rib, but not L2 fib. And that's how you get the scale for the uh, MAC addresses. Uh, the remote uh, PEs that they get these MAC and IP advertisement, they only uh, populate uh, the L3 FIB for the IP address, as well as L3 RIB, but only uh, L2 RIB, not L2 FIB. Uh, so we already went through, we already talked about this. And uh, for the first data packet, when uh, it comes in the first data packet. Uh, if it is known to the PE1, if the destination is known, it gets forwarded. If it is not known, uh, then uh, the uh, it gets sent to the it gets it goes through the Glean procedure, which means it gets sent to the CPU, and the CPU says, "I don't know. Uh, I'm gonna initiate the uh, ARP request." Uh, for the H2 to find out where the MAC, uh, where it is, and what the MAC address is associated with. Ali, can you can you wrap up, please, because we're out of time. Sure. Uh, the ARP uh, response handling is uh, pretty clear cut. Uh, the ARP response, when it comes, it uh, triggers the raw type two and the raw type to get advertised. And then uh, two of the interrupt scenario it talks about. So the, uh, the uh, nice thing about the, this uh, optimized IRB is that it is seamlessly it can work with the existing EVPN IRB. And there are two scenarios in here. Uh, one uh, where uh, when the, uh, the first scenario is when uh, uh, host sitting behind the optimized IRB in each, uh, uh, the first one is when host sitting behind the traditional IRB initiates the ARP, and then the second scenario is when the host sitting behind the optimized IRB initiates the ARP. As you can see, when you go through, uh, through these uh, scenarios, you will see that uh, because we have this mismatch of the uh, traditional IRB and the L3 optimized IRB, the L3 optimized IRB falls back to the traditional mode and it starts doing the bridging uh, for the intra subnet traffic. So in a network that you have a mix of uh, traditional and L3 optimized IRB, the L3 optimized uh, IRB PEs gonna be doing routing for intra subnet, but as soon as they talk to a traditional one, they fall back to the British mode. Okay. So that's okay. it. Thank you. Can we take all the questions to the list, please? Because we really are way over time now. Come again? Can we take the questions to the discussion to the list, for this draft, please? Because we're just way over time. We're 10 minutes over. Can I ask a very simple question? For Ali to for the list. This looks like a solution looking for a problem. We are in 2020. If you want to route, just route. So I guess you didn't see the problem at the beginning, right? There is a problem, a statement clearly is stated. So did you miss that uh, slide? I have a question. So, Sasha, could, Sasha, we're out. Sorry, Sasha, we're really out of time. We, we have to take it to this. Sorry. May I ask a question or not? No, can you can you ask it on the list, please? Take it to the best list because we're we're running over time. Okay, I'll ask it on the list. No, Thank, you. Thank you. Um... Okay. Hello, everybody. My name is Christian Schmutzer from Cisco and I'm trying to give you an update on private line emulation and TDM pseudo wire signaling. Try to be short and sweet, I promise. Um, this may be a, a topic that you wonder why I'm talking about that because TDM is old, but uh, with the scalability of ethernet and uh, routing silicon coming um, to great highs, um, there's actually some cool things about 
actually carrying bit streams over packet networks in the future. Um, this is actually about a draft that we have started a while ago. Uh, I made a rookie mistake renaming it because I changed a little bit the content, uh, but uh, sometimes you learn your things the hard way. Next slide. Ali, did you, did you walk off with the... Oh. Cunningly hidden. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you. so signaling private line emulation pseudowise, maybe let me remind you first what private line emulation pseudowise are. Those are essentially bit stream pseudowires that allow you to take bits in, encapsulate them into packets and send them across the network. Uh, this is somewhat of an old hat. We have done that for uh, TDM and channelized stuff on SDH, and we are now uh, doing that for higher speed interfaces, for example, Ethernet, fiber channel, and the likes. Um, we have defined a bunch of payloads, and uh, we are using the co control word again. So um, nothing rev revolutionary, but an evolution of what has been done in the past, uh, and the draft got adopted by the PALS working group. Um, speaking about why would you do that, let me show you here an example. Today, enterprise customers doing data center interconnect deployments uh, are required to build not only a front-end Ethernet MTLS network, but also a parallel network consisting of DWDM to interconnect storage and fiber channel switches. This is often a managed service and for some customers quite painful. If you actually have the ability to carry literally anything over a packet network, you now can uh, interconnect your fiber channel switches over your IP MTLS infrastructure. And with that, you can, can get rid of the, ex, uh, the, ex, the extra network, saving cost, power, and headaches. Yeah, I can't, I can't mute it. So how could we signal those pseudo-wires? Um, we have been defining, or actually not me, but uh, you guys, a long time ago, uh, defined already extensions to LDP to signal things that are needed to ensure that for a bitstream pseudo wire, we, we can ensure that we have the same pseudo wire type on both ends, that the attachment circuit type is the same, as well as the payload size. Uh, there is a new requirement that we're bringing up because in TDM networks that generally is uh, something that is done, is to ensure that you actually interconnect the two correct endpoints with your circuit. So in this document, uh, we are proposing to extend the EVPN VPWS machinery to also carry the information that used to be carried in LDP. And I'm trying to put it somewhat side by side. And why I'm doing it side by side as well, I want to show you that we're not, again, trying to reinvent the wheel, but we're trying to evolve what has been done in the past and has been proven to be successful to basically try to align that, but change the, the protocol or also provide the BGP EVP and VPWS protocol as an option to signal those pseudo wires. Now, I talked about private line emulation, but by basically following this approach, we can also signal the legacy, so to speak, TDM pseudo wires that have been in the pa uh, signaled in the past. So if somebody wants to deploy that with BGP EVPN, this would be possible now as well. Um, we are proposing to do that with a new BGP uh, attribute, and the sub-TLVs that I'm putting out here are essentially carrying the same or similar content that used to be done in LDP. Sorry, uh, Sasha, can you please mute yourself, please? We don't seem to be able to mute you from, from up here. You left your mic on. Sorry. So last slide. I uh, would appreciate uh, your review and your comments uh, and thoughts on the signaling approach. And I also wanted to point out that the data plane draft uh, is already a PALS uh, working group document. So if uh, you, you think that the document that we have put out here is making sense, uh, I would consider the working group to also think about adopting it uh, as a draft to uh, put the signaling work in, uh, in motion and not only the data plane. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, okay. Uh, do we have time for a question? One quick question. One question, okay. Uh, Chris, sorry. Ooh. <laughs> Very quick one. So I, I know the uh, data plane uh, draft talks about the control word and, and the sequence and all that, but on the on, on this draft, there is no mentioning of the control word other than you, you have to signal 
the capability, right? But it, it would be nice if you had a sentence saying uh, that the control world uh, is, is no longer all zeros, right? Because so far in all the EVP and specifications, the control world was, was always zero. That's one thing. And the other thing is fat label. Do we, I, I guess we don't want to use it here, but uh, it would be nice to clarify in the draft what we do with that. Yeah, that's, that, that's a good point. I mean, fat label doesn't apply here because uh, we don't have fl flows inside. This is basically yeah. uh, just a big flow, right? Uh, I can clarify that. And so maybe we, we, we should disallow it in this draft. Okay, okay. I will take that and uh, we'll consider that for the next version. Right. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Hey folks, my name is Kehir Patel. I'm going to talk about um, the MOP Safi. This draft was first presented in IETF uh, 113. Um, I'm going to give a quick refresher and then talk about the changes to the draft that has been made. Um, here are the list of the contributors. Uh, version 3 now has Derek Young, who is uh, the most recent contributor to the draft. Um, motivation, you know, SRV6 MOP architecture defines SRV6 mobile user plane uh, for distributed mobility management. And basically what this architecture does is integrates mobile user plane with SRV6 data plane. And it does that by taking the session information you get from mobility management and transforms it into the routing information. So as part of this architecture, two new segment types are being defined. Um, they're called direct and interwork. And then you've got a two new session transform routes. They are typically generated by the controllers. Um, the segment types that have been defined are typically announced by PEs, depending on where they sit in the network. So um, the use cases are very well defined into um, the architecture draft. I encourage you all to go take a look at it. But what this draft does is it defines a new PGP SAFI, um, basically to carry the segments and um, the associated routes alongside with it. And it also defines a new extent community. Here is how the NLRI looks like. Uh, basically, it's quite flexible. The architecture type uh, for this draft has been set to 3GPP 5G, um, and it can be extensible. Um, all the route types that are defined um, ensures um, that they are compatible uh, for the future versions as well. And you've got about four new route types defined as part of this SAFI. Um, and like I said, uh, these route types can be shared. Two well-known uh, segments are, are being defined and they are translated into two different routing instances. You've got an N3 RAN and you've got an N6DN. Um, N3 RAN typically connects between your G node Bs and your UPFs, and N6DN typically connects between UPF and IP network. Um, and essentially, all the routing information that has been created as part of the segments is been redistributed inside the BGP. Um, you have G node B prefixes that are announced, and then you have uh, prefixes. Uh, for the MOP segments that are being announced as well, they have an associated attributes that are being listed here. Now you've got two new route types also defined. You have a type one route that basically is imported by N6DN instance, and it carries the UE information uh, that the controller learns from the uh, uh, mobility session. And it then carries alongside with it the necessary attributes from the mobility side, and it injects it inside PGP as we talked about. The one point to note is that the source address that has been defined in version three has been kept as an optional. Um, the implementation requires it. You either configure it or you either announce it inside the SAFI explicitly. Depending on the flex, uh, way you want to do it, it's quite flexible um, one way or another, but you need to announce that information uh, so, that BG, uh, so that the routing can uh, make use of it. Type two is 
typically imported by N3 RAN routing instance, and it carries the endpoint address um, and the associated GTP tunnel information. The necessary attributes are also associated with it, and you also carry BGP extended community that has been listed here. Over and above, you have route target extended communities um, that are there to ensure that the routes are imported in their associated routing instances appropriately. So that was a quick refresher. We now have version three. Um, version three of the draft um, has following changes that are already incorporated from version two. We have added n.m.gt4 slash 6.e for the direct segment. And then the version three has a notion for optional support of source address that will be carried in the type one ST route that I've talked about. Now, from the draft perspective, it's in a pretty good shape. Uh, the version three has already been submitted. Multiple interoperable implementations exist, both from vendors as well as from open source. A major customer trials are also underway. So we'd request at this time um, two working group chairs to consider it for adoption. That's all I have. Any questions? Okay, thanks. Thank you. Hi, I'm Hish, and I'm going to present the MAP Yang model draft. Um, so this draft basically talks about configuration and management of the mobile user plane. Um, and I'm going to skip most of the rest of the slide because KU kind of went over it. Uh, the only point to mention that uh, he said is it recommends use of BGP to carry the new SAFI BGP MAP information. The model itself augments the BGP Yang model. Uh, it adds two uh, containers, the IPv4 MUP and the V6 MUP at a global level, basically to carry the MUP capability for uplink and downlink. It augments the BGP policy Yang model and adds conditions and actions. Um, All right, um, it does have uh, examples that I've added to make sure that it, the model is validated against those examples. There are, is a complete configuration example for the SRV6 MUP, and of course for the route and segment types under IPv4. And more examples can be added if there is interest in that. Uh, next steps, the, <laughs> we believe that the initial cut of the Yang model is mostly done. As I said, they are validated against examples. Now there is an expected revision that will go and add uh, the other necessary sections, such as security consideration and IANA, and if any operational data. And at this point, at least the authors believe that it's a um, good candidate for work group adoption. Um, for anyone who's interested, the overall model is available for anyone to review in GitHub at these two links. And issues are being tracked there. Any questions? OK, thank you. Hello, everyone. This is Meng Xiaocheng from UH3C Technologies. On behalf of my co-authors, I will give a presentation about SRV6 service seed flag extension for multi-homing SRV6 BGP services. Next slide, please. Uh, this draft describes uh, use cases for no further FRR service seed and any cast service seed in the multi-homing uh, scenarios. 
and defines new flags for them when advertising through BGP messages. Next slide, please. Uh, this draft was presented at 116 meeting for the first time. Uh, after the meeting, we revised the draft according to received comments. We changed uh, pass, bypass seed to no further FR seed, aligning with the existing works on uh, MPRS data plane. Uh, we added a, a new section to describe the consideration for eVPN single active mode. Next slide, please. Uh, the first use case is egress fast reroute. P3 and P4 establish a backup path between them and use it as a protection of PC link failure. Each of P3 and P4 advertises a service seed for BGP route of CE, and they use each other's service seed as the FRR of its own service seed to protect C side link failure. However, when the link P3, C3, and P4, C3 fail at the same time, uh, the FRR on both P3 and P4 will work, and the traffic will be looping between them until routing convergence. Next slide, please. Uh, the solution is to advertise an additional no further FRR service seed. No further FRR service seed has no local protection. Uh, when PC link fails, packets will be dropped. Uh, P3 and P4 advertise both uh, uh, normal service seed and uh, no further FRR service seed to uh, reflector and uh, use each other's no further FR service seed as backup. Uh, when their C side links fail at the same time, uh, one will use the other piece no further FR serv service seed to encapsulate the packet. Then the other P will drop the packet. Uh, so routing loops can be avoided. Next slide, please. Uh, here are some considerations for eVPN single active mode. Uh, the eVPN services include DF election procedure. In single active mode, only DF is allowed to forward unicast traffic. The processing of the no further FR seed should apply an override to eVPN DF election and bypass the local blocking state on the AC link until eVPN control plane reconverts. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the second use case is anycast load balancing. Uh, ingress P1 and P2 have different traffic steering policies. Uh, P1 wants to use uh, Anycast service seed, and the traffic can be forwarded to P3 and P4 in a load balanced manner. Uh, however, uh, P2 wants to deploy VPN FRR by using the unicast service seed of P3 as a primary next hop and P4 as a backup. The solution is that uh, egress P3 and P4 advertises uh, both the uh, uh, anycast service seed and the unicast service seed through BGP. Uh, and uh, the ingress uh, P1 and P2 uh, use different service seeds to forward traffic. It should be mentioned that uh, IGP has anycast flag for SRV6 locator. Uh, however, uh, so IGP anycast flag may be lost due to summarization. Uh, so BGP needs to identify which is um, an anycast seed. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide is about the BGP extensions. Uh, this draft defines two new uh, SRV6 service seed flag, N flag for no further FR seed and the A flag for anycast seed. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide is about backward compatibility. Uh, 
uh, in RFC 9252 specified that uh, when multiple SRVs succeed the information sub-TLVs are present, the ingress PE should use the SRV seed from the first instance of sub-TLV. And uh, any unknown flags in the SRV uh, service seed flags field must be ignored. Therefore, uh, when the egress PE advertises multiple service seeds, the unicast service seed need to be carried in the first instance of sub TLV. Uh, when there are uh, some PE routers not supporting the new defined flags, uh, the egress PE may ex expect those uh, routers to use the first seed and ignore the new defined flags. Next slide, please. Uh, here are some considerations for why uh, we prefer to use SRV6 service seed flags rather than defining new behaviors. Uh, one reason is that uh, whether to provide FRR for service seed is a local configuration or egress node. A second reason is that IGP also has any cast flag and a backup flag for SRV6 seed. A third reason is that uh, service seed has various behaviors. Uh, using seed flag is more simple than defining new ones for each existing behavior. Next slide, please. Uh, next step, we would like to ask for working group adoption. Any questions or comments are welcomed. I don't see anyone in the list. Thank you. Hello. Go ahead, um, okay. Hi, everyone. It's Si Yu from Huawei Technologies. I'm here to present our draft of simplified MVPN for beer and ingress replication on behalf of my co author, Fang Hong. Next slide, please. In RFC uh, 6037, uh, Rosen firstly proposed an MVPN procedure, and PIM was the only protocol to build PIM C tunnels. In RFC 6513 and 14, more P2 and P tunnels are discussed, such as RSVPT and MLDP. MVPN over ingress replication was also specified. In order to trade off between optimality and scalability, two types of PMCs are in used. Inclusive PMC can deliver traffic to any PE that attach to the same NVPN domain. It stores less status information but costs more bandwidth. The selective PMC can track egress PE explicitly and deliver data traffic to those PE who need the data traffic. In IFC, 8534, the explicit tracking of egress nodes are optimized. In RFC 8556, beer is introduced as one tunnel type to optimize multicast forwarding. Next slide, please. I draw two types of PMC tunnels here. As you can see, instantiate inclusive PMC is a common first step to establish MDT over provider network. When traffic exceeds preset threshold, switching from I to S is inevitable for, for MLDP or ISVPT. Next slide, please. Selective multicast is necessary for P2 and P tunnel for saving bandwidth. But for beer and ingress replication, complicated NLRI exchange and switching from I to S tunnel are not necessary. The I to S switching involves very complicated exchange of control plan and data plan. Ingress PE follows traditional process of establishing multicast tunnel. It also maintains and checks whether multicast flow at any time so to switching from I to S. Three types of NLRIs involves 
the in process of customers routes advertisement and four types of NLRs are leveraged to collect and announce tunnel information. Next slide, please. We think when the underlay tunnel is fear or ingress replication, the SPMC tunnel can be constructed directly because current NVPN architecture and NLRI exchanges are too heavy for them. Their architecture advantages, which are intrinsically support for explicit tracking at ingress PE. Each leaf PE is uniquely identified. Besides, segment routing is widely discussed, implemented, and regarded as a simplification of MPLS. We think simplification is a trend and is worth considering. We simplify the seven types of NIRI. Type one to the four are replaced by the new MVPN eligible UMH route with MSID subdomain and BFRID. The MSID is used to represent MVPN instance. More beer or IRPTA can be added. Type six to seven NLRIs are simplified and merged as a new per leaf C multicast route. The flag field is used to distinguish between the C multicast join or prone. The other fields were also carried by the original C multicast routes. Next slide, please. The NLRI exchange will be very simple after we introduce new types of routes and simplify the procedure of I to S switching. As you can see in the figure, there will be no uh, I to S switching and no more type one to three root. And there is no need to separate C multicast and leaf AD. And the explicit tracking will be always conducted. Next slide, please. So uh, we briefly introduce our ideas here and we hope best working group and everyone who are interested in MVPN can join us to consider the probability of implementing this. We will also optimize and update the solution path in the future. That's all, thank you. Any comments or questions? Yeah, okay. Um, so Jeffrey, uh, John from Juniper, I actually have some comments that I will bring to the list. Um, there are alternative ways to, to achieve this and the, we're also discussing another draft. Um, but, um, but we'll talk about details on the mailing list. Thanks. Jeff, uh, Patrice, you're on in a moment. All right. Good afternoon. I'm Patrice Brissa from Cisco. I'm here to present the draft the L3 multi homing. So, uh, yeah, this is a draft that has been around for a little while. Um, so, the problem statement here is quite simple is whenever you're doing AVPN multi homing and the interfaces are L3 interface, so uh, we still need to support the load balancing. So, therefore, we need to be able to provide uh, the synchronization of our tables like RPND, multicast, and um, also sometimes the IGPs. So, so now for the solution, um, well, it's it's based on all existing machinery. So uh, so again, we are using RAP type twos for the RPND, seven and eight for the multicast. Five is there if you want to synchronize your verb table, and also. Um, what is more special is that how you identify your L3 interface whenever you do the synchronization. So therefore we use the L3 word targets that will represent your verb. Um, the SI is like for your interface and we use um, the attachment circuit that will tell you your VLAN or subnet. And there's a few more options that describes in the draft, but this is mainly what this is about. So the big advantage of this is then we have a solution which is completely agnostic from the underlays, and we don't have any dedicated ICCP channel. So you don't need to do either like uh, ICCP base, which mandate LDP. Um, so therefore, by leveraging all the machinery that we have to do with VPN, we can do, uh, we can do that. Um, the things also is the solution has been already deployed and uh, it's on the field for multiple years and works quite well. The draft is also multi-vendors, so we are uh, 
So we are like having collaboration across um, multiple companies. So our next step for us is we are asking for work group adoption so we can move this work forward. That's it. Hey, thank you. I'd encourage folks to, to read the draft and, and send any, any comments to the list. And I think with that, we're more or less thank done. You. Anything? Thanks very much. It was a battle. <laughs> <laughs> think a few presenters who cut short on their presentation. We were... Well, the, everybody got at least their, their time's up. Um, mm -hmm. Everybody got, I think, I don't quite know how we caught up. One or two, one or two just finished early. Right, right. That's what I meant. Those people. Yeah, we didn't come on. Yeah, it's a discussion we cut off. We, but, but you know, you don't know. We don't know. We, don't we know. Before those uh, two presenters, uh, we were 10 minutes over already. Mm. And then Magically, they, they finished their very sort of Surprisingly, the folks from Huawei finished early. Yeah. Yeah. Usually, take longer. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I did not know. Oh, there you go. <laughs> now I know. Yeah. So,